Good afternoon, everybody. You know, a couple of weeks ago when I decided to give this talk and I was thinking about what I was going to say, I knew I wanted to talk about something I've been thinking a lot about, which is the death of democracy. Because things were going really bad, and they have been in Congress and in government generally for the last few years, but I had no idea that things would work out so perfectly, that the government would be shut down, we would be on the edge of, the, uh, of defaulting on our debts for the first time in history, and I'd like to thank Congress for doing everything they can to make my talk more timely. <laughs> thank you. Now, I want to say, before I get started, that I'm going to be talking about some political things tonight, but not in an electoral sense. And the things I'm going to be talking about are not about Democrats and Republicans, although there's some implications there. Democrats and Republicans are both guilty, in some senses, of what I'm talking about. But since we're in Pennsylvania, and I'm going to be talking about Pennsylvania because it's what I know best, the Republicans happen to be in charge of everything here, so they're going to have done what some of the things I'm talking about. If we were in a different state, it would be the Democrats often who would have done the same thing. So I want everyone to relax, whether you're a Democrat or Republican. <laughs> all right. First, this all, the whole problem, and what is the problem? The problem is right now that we can't get anything done. We've, we've stopped being able to solve big problems in this country. We've stopped being able to move forward in many ways. And there's some basic reasons for that. And it all starts here, uh, in ancient Greece, where this is where democracy was born. The word literally means rule of the people. And it involves the people getting together and making decisions, participating equally, equally in the role of, in their government. It's based on the idea of majority rule. You know, we're going to have vigorous debates about a lot of issues, but we have to have a mechanism to resolve these, these issues, come to a conclusion, and move forward to other things, decide things. Not everything. Not everything is majority rule. We don't vote on what God you pray to. We don't vote on what books you read. And when we were talking about, when the founders were talking about electing presidents, and they were, and they were worried that the people, if left to their own devices, would form an unruly mob, <laughs> they created the Electoral College in order to prevent that from happening. But on most things, the majority rules. We decide what the speed limit is. The majority decides how much we spend on education, what, what our environmental policies are, what our health care policies are. But in recent years, there's been a movement by a minority, not an ethnic or a racial minority, but a, a, but a political minority, to actually steal our democracy. And how are they doing this? How are they stealing this democracy? Well, they're doing three things to undermine the whole concept of majority rule. Number one, they're making it harder to, to vote, to participate. Number two, even if you do vote, they're making it so your vote does not affect the outcome of an election. And I just want to say that again so you think about this. You can vote, but in many elections, your vote will not affect the outcome of that election. And number three, they're doing it so even if you elect someone that you like, they can't actually accomplish the things that you elected them to do. Now let's start with making it so your vote can, because it's the most intriguing to me, your vote cannot affect the outcome of an election. How are they doing that? It all starts in Massachusetts about 200 years ago. You see, every 10 years, we have to draw new lines for congressional and legislative districts. That's because the courts say every district has to have the same number of people, right? And so, we have a situation where, the, you know, we have the population moves and we have to draw the lines to reflect that movement. The problem is that the politicians who run in the districts are the very same ones who drew, draw the lines. And so as a result, they're the ones who are deciding what the districts are. And this started in Massachusetts by a guy named, there was a guy named Elbridge Jerry. And he had a buddy and he wanted to keep him in Congress, so he, draw, he drew a district that his buddy could never lose. And his political opponents called it a gerrymander because it looked like a salamander. I don't think it actually had the teeth, but I mean, the rest of it was good. <laughs> and that's, that term stuck. And we do that to this day, except we're much more aggressive about it. I want everyone to take a look at today's 7th Congressional District. Thank you. Thank you. That is the 7th Congressional District in Pennsylvania. The, everything, the whole blue is the 7th District. Now, if you look at it, you're like, why was it drawn that way? 
Well, it was drawn that way because there's a very nice man, an incumbent down there, who lives in Delaware County, Republican. Unfortunately, there are too many Delaware, there are Democrats surrounding him to give him a safe seat. So they had to draw his district so it went all the way to rural Lancaster and Berks County to find enough Republicans to give him a seat that he could never possibly lose if he was convicted of treason, okay? <laughs> Every single one of those jagged edges is an attempt to avoid an inconvenient Democratic neighborhood. Let's take a look at the 13th, let's take a look at the 13th district. That's another similar district. This is the opposite. This is where they took every Democrat they could find and dumped them into one district, and they did this with a few districts around the, around the country, to make sure that the Democrats would have a few and the Republicans would have more. And remember, in states like Indiana where it happened, the Democrats controlled. In California, the Democrats do the same thing. Okay? And so what does this result in? What this results in, and this is very important, in Pennsylvania, last time, there were 90,000 more voters who voted Democratic than Republican for Congress. 90,000 more. So there were 18 seats, right? You would expect, based on those results, either a 9 to 9 or a 10 to 8 Democratic split. Well, this is the actual split. It's 13 to 5 Republican. All right? And Pennsylvania is not the only one. I mean, Ohio is similar. It was a 50-50 in terms of the votes for Democrats, Republicans, approximately. That's what Ohio looks like. All right? And if you extrapolate this to the United States of America, we have this. 1.1 million more Democrats voted, people voted for Democratic congressmen than Republicans, but we have 33 more Republican seats. Now, Elbridge Jerry would be very jealous of this, but he could not dream of the computer technology that we have now. That's the best I could find. But. <laughs> where we can draw literally block by block and predict what's going to happen. Now, our elections have become, as a result, sort of like Soviet elections. There is an election, people go to vote, but everyone knows who's going to win before the first vote is cast. Now, that, don't get me wrong, elections can still be fun. If your poll is like mine, they have a bake sale, and so you can buy a donut <laughs> or a bagel. You can meet up with your neighbors. <laughs> sort of an obscure reference, but yeah. <laughs> but your vote doesn't count. Everyone knows every election in Pennsylvania who's going to win next time, no matter what the turnout is, no matter what the, whether it's raining, no matter any of that. And why is this a problem? This is a problem for a number of reasons. Malapportionment, as we talked about. Politicians who aren't accountable. But there's an even worse problem. Because if you're, in a, if you're a congressperson and you're in a 50-50 district, you have to worry about getting votes from the other side. If I'm a Democrat, I have to worry about getting some Republicans and independents to vote for me. And if I'm a Republican, I have to get some Democrats. That means I have to look reasonable. I have to look sane, okay? I have to have bipartisan achievements. I have to talk about how I'm working across the aisle. I have to compromise. I have to be reasonable. But if I'm in a district that's 65, 70, 75 percent my party, and I can never lose to the opposite party, I have no political incentive to talk to them at all. The only thing I have to worry about is losing a primary to someone who is more ideological than I am. So what is my political incentive? It's to be crazy. <laughs> And that's because a Democrat never has to worry about losing the Republican. They only have to worry about a primary from the left. And a Republican never has to worry about losing because they only have to worry about a Tea Party challenge. <laughs> and what has this done? This, this has brought us, you know, there used to be liberal Republicans in the legislature and Congress. There used to be conservative Democrats. There used to be moderates of both parties. All three of those species are largely extinct now. Now, issue number two, making it harder to vote, and this is more of a partisan issue, but we can't pretend it's something it's not if we're going to talk about it honestly. There's a number of states that pass laws that require strict voter ID. You have to show a photo ID in order to vote. And for most people, the photo ID is the driver's license. 
Now, there are some easily identified demographic groups who tend not to have driver's licenses. They tend to be the people, oddly enough, who don't drive. <laughs> it's a little more, you know, mainstream than the neighbors think. Anyway, they tend to be people not drive, including poor people, minorities, and people who live in inner cities, college students, and Zsa Zsa Gabor. <laughs> Actually, not Zsa Zsa specifically. Um, what I mean is older people. Um, and Zsa Zsa is 95 now. I couldn't find a current photo, but you get the idea. And Zsa Zsa will reappear later in our story. Okay? But, now this sounds reasonable at first. People should show ID before they vote. But when you scrutinize it, it becomes a little bit more troubling. Because these groups that don't have IDs, they tend to all vote overwhelmingly for one political party. And according to the Pennsylvania Department of State, and this is just Pennsylvania, if, when, if this law were upheld by the courts and went into effect, 750,000 people, almost all, over 80% of one party, would be disenfranchised with the stroke of a pen. Now, that's worth it if there's a real problem to solve. Okay, but there's, there are a lot of, and the, the problem they talk about is voter fraud. Now, there are lots of types of voter fraud, stuffing the ballot boxes, messing with the machines, registering someone else or whatever, but there's only one type of voter fraud that would be affected by voter ID, and that's in-person voter impersonation. That's where you go to the polls pretending that you were someone you were not in order to get a vote <laughs> that you do not deserve. Now, in order to dis justify disenfranchising 750,000 people, this must happen a lot. In reality, it never happens. And when I say never happens, I'm not meaning it in a sort of hyperbolic way, like, well, it happens rarely, or it happens so infrequently it's not wor worth worrying about. Turns out, it never happens. The governor signed the thing, who's defending the lawsuit against us in Pennsylvania, saying he could not cite one case in the entire nation where this has actually happened. Not one case. And why is that? Because it's very hard to commit this crime. It's very easy to get caught. If I'm going to impersonate someone, I got to know they're registered at a poll. I got to know um, that, that they haven't already voted that day. I got to know that none of the six or seven people from that neighborhood who are there every day will not recognize that I am not Richard Nixon or whoever it is that is up there. All right? And if I'm caught, five years in jail. It seems like very few people are willing to risk five years in prison to get one lousy vote in an election that's going to be decided by hundreds or thousands of votes. The final thing is abuse of the rules, and there's lots of that, and I, I, we don't have time to talk about today, but I want to talk about just one thing, which is the filibuster. The filibuster is where, you know, it takes 51 votes, according to the Constitution, to, to, in the House and the Senate to pass a bill, 51% but it takes 60 votes in the Senate to bring it up for a vote. Just quickly, looking at, this is the rate of filibusters in America. There have been, there were zero, almost zero, the first 150 years of our existence. During the 60s, the civil rights legislation, there was a few, two or three a year, which was a lot historically. Now, you need 60 votes to name a post office. <laughs> so what is, what is the result of all this? The result of all this, again, your vote doesn't matter, it's going to be hard for you to vote, and even if you do vote and your guy wins, they're not going to be able to do anything. That's why our democracy is in great jeopardy. Now, I know the best TED Talks have a happy ending. <laughs> okay? Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, it, the thing I want, and this is a happy ending for, in a different way, but I just want to say this. <laughs> if you want marriage equality, or if you want more money for schools, or if you want tougher environmental restrictions, or if you want looser gun laws, or if you want lower taxes, or if you want more money for the military, because this hurts the right and the left, our inability to do anything, we've got to fix this. How do we fix this? First of all, you have to know about it. Now you do. Second of all, you have to get mad, because you know, people get mad, and it can still make a difference, but often people get mad about the wrong things. They hear a legislator get a free haircut, and they're in the streets over that. My favorite story is one time our good friend, Zsa Zsa Gabor, a few years ago, got arrested for speeding and slapping a police officer. The next day, 500 people showed up with free Zsa Zsa signs. <laughs> I mean, 
you know, no offense to Zsa Zsa, but my haircut or her momentary inconvenience is nothing compared to your democracy being stolen. That is what's happening. You have to get mad. You have to confront your legislators at town meetings in their office. You have to start, uh, uh, you know, um, tweeting and Facebooking and four squaring and twerking or whatever it is you're doing. <laughs> Incidentally, <laughs> incidentally, that was plan B for my speech today. So, um, okay. But you have to do that. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to our children. We owe it to our country. And we owe it to them. You know, Ben Franklin was asked after he came out of the deliberations uh, about the Constitution when, when, during uh, the, our founding, the founding times, he was asked by a woman, Dr. Franklin, do we have a monarchy or a republic? And he said, we have a republic if you can keep it. And I think this is the moment that Ben Franklin was talking about, because I don't want to sound alarmist, but the reason we're not Syria, the reason we don't kill each other when we have political differences is because we believe that no matter how much we may dislike an administration or a governor or a president, we're going to work really hard and get our guy in there next time. And when that's no longer feasible, something very basic of the American fabric has been ripped apart. And it's time that we start paying attention to that, because we're quickly reaching a point of no return. So it's up to you to save the republic. Thank you very much. <laughs>